Hi, I'm Dr. Hackey Reitman. Welcome to another episode of Exploring Different Brains. And today we have all the way from Israel, the neurodiversity advocate, Jackie Edry. And Jackie is an author, a dedicated neurodiversity advocate, and she has some story to tell herself. Jackie, welcome to Different Brains. Welcome, and thank you so much for having me on the program. I'm deeply honored. I really am. Well, I got to tell you, I um, reading your story and learning about you is just uh, great. Why don't you share with our audience a bit about your brain surgery and the impact it's had on you? Uh, okay, about eight years ago, I had uh, complex complex brain surgery. Basically, um, it was a five centimeter round tumor discovered in on my brain stem, and uh, that had the uh, um, major nerves involved, the central nerves involved. So it was quite quite a um, dangerous situation. And I underwent surgery and uh, they couldn't remove the entire tumor either because, because of the nerves that were involved. Um, so I do have a little bit of a piece of my, remaining in my brain. Um, and when I woke up, I found that I had become neurodivergent, um, which is very interesting for me because I have a son with autism and I've worked with children on the spectrum for many, many years. And I also have other neurodivergent children and all, all the things I sort of observed during the years I found were now part of me. And so I was no longer an, absorb, uh, an observer, I was actually experiencing the things with the uh, cognition and understanding of somebody who's worked at, uh, in uh, education and therapy so I've been on, on both sides of the coin and it was quite interesting um, to experience that. I mean, it wasn't fun. It was really difficult, actually. And to date, I still have uh, many issues, but it was an incredible learning experience. And I kind of figured that if I'd gone through such a learning experience, I might as well do something useful with it and try and uh, help uh, others understand what that feels like. Um, so that's, that's a little uh, bit I about wanted it. to get that on the table first for our okay. audience so they okay. know where you're coming from, sure. from your unique point of view. I understand. Now you can introduce yourself properly. Okay. <laughs> um, I don't know where to start. Um, um, like I said, I'm the, I have a background in uh, education. Uh, my thesis was in educating uh, autistic children, actually, many, many years ago, um, and marketing and writing. Those are my three things that I've sort of gone back and forth with all of the years, and I've sort of put them all together um, to write a book and a blog and, and um, to try and help spread the word about uh, neurodiversity. I'm a parent. I have uh, five children. Um, every one of them is uniquely neurodivergent. Um, and... I spend my, and I have a wonderful therapy dog as well in our house, and she helps out all of our family. And um, now you live in Israel. What is the state of awareness and acceptance of neurodiversity in Israel? Um, Israel, in many ways, is a very, very forward country, uh, or pretends to be, but in, in terms of um, Treatment, budget for therapies, um, it's uh, inclusion, uh, inclusion in education and inclusion in the workplace. Um, we are way behind. Um, it's very, very difficult for parents to raise uh, a child with, I think, any disability, actually, in, in this country. There's not enough funding. Inclusion is practically impossible in the sense uh, that um, because of limited funding, the children who, let's say, need a one-to-one -one assistant in schools will not get the entire number of hours to cover the school day, or they'll have untrained professionals. School teachers, as a general rule, are not trained. So when they even they want to do inclusion, as teachers are not trained to to carry on the you know to carry it out properly. Um, it's, it's just a real fight for parents, especially parents who, who choose to go over the role of, uh, of inclusion as opposed to special education. Um, very difficult, very, very difficult. 
what would you say might be the social changes that need to go on in Israel? Um, I think that to, the society needs to come become aware that everybody is a unique and divine individual um, and that everybody has something to contribute it. And there is, there is a bit of a trend. I mean, now we have a, a, a Knesset member who's is deaf. Um, you know, there's, there's more awareness. There's some we have Knesset members also are in wheelchairs and various kinds of physical handicaps um, that are more aware. But in terms of neurodiverse, neurodiversity, there's really a, a backwardsness. Um, there, there are some programs now for um, including uh, people with disabilities or, or autism in, in the army, which is, is things are starting to move very slowly. So they recognize that uh, sometimes people who are uh, neurodivergent have unique talents that can be tapped into some high tech companies as well. Um, but there isn't that, you know, I, I think people with disabilities in general tend to live on the side of society as opposed to being really fully integrated into communities. Um, and people with autism tend to be separated into specific programs for people with autism. So what happens in that sense is that, um, you know, I, let's say for my son who's 24 um, and he does have um, quite a number of abilities. Um, if I wanted to um, help him go into the workplace, um, they're like special programs, but they clump all the people with autism together. They don't actually, um, there's nothing, that mixes people with different abilities together. Um, it's very, very, very difficult. And that needs to change. Sorry, my son decided to make noise in the kitchen. I feel like he can't. <laughs> I'm sure. in my living room. Well, tell All us right. more about your son. My son on the spectrum? Mm -hmm. um, he's 24. He's, he's got very limited verbal skills. Um, which is actually one of the, the, the difficult things because people don't really understand that a um, person with limited verbal skills might have a lot of understanding. Um, so that will tend to make situations like, especially with jobs or getting to know people, they will, they will not necessarily understand that he has a high intelligence or a competence that, that is there. Um, he's an amazing human being. He's, he's taught us all so much um, and he's very determined to grow and learn and make the best of himself. And he, um, he knows he's different, but he doesn't um, think that's the problem. You know, he's just part of society. Everyone's different. And I, how are his writing skills? Uh, in terms of, um, Spelling and, and, and things like that. It's like able to communicate with alternative communication. Yes, he's, he's fine. Motor communicate, motor uh, ability coordination is very difficult for him, but he types beautifully. So, so that he does, although it's very difficult for him to communicate in terms, even with that, it's much, much better than his spoken um, ability, but he, it does help. And we, we actually use WhatsApp with him a lot lately, and that helps. He's, he's starting to develop more of a fluid language and more complete sentences. Um, and I, I would suggest it to everyone because most people have a cell phone. It's like a regular thing to do. Everyone communicates on, at least here on WhatsApp. So, um, you know, they send movies and they send pictures and he thinks in pictures, actually. Um, it's very interesting when there's a new concept. The first thing that he does is he goes to Google pictures and he'll type it in so that he can try and figure it out. And then after that, he translates it into language because he wants to communicate. He wants to communicate with people. Um, and he's learned language in order to communicate with people. But he's definitely, his mother tongue is not English or he which absolutely pictures. But tell yeah. us about the rest Fascinating. of you. Fascinating. Yeah. Um, okay, so I have, I have my, my daughter is a, uh, the oldest and she's a sign language interpreter. And huh. she has a degree in special education as well. But she works mostly as, and a, and a social activist. Um, and then there's my, my son that was just on the spectrum. And then I have a son in the army, just a soldier, doing his duty, uh, working hard, Very proud of him. Uh, my son in, uh, in a high school that just started high school and some that just started junior high school. Hmm. And most of them have stuff, whether, whether it's ADHD or uh, 
auditory processing issues, um, Ireland syndrome, which has made reading very difficult for several of them until we discovered uh, about Ireland syndrome, they were diagnosed with uh, dyslexia and uh, ADHD. But once we discovered Ireland a few years ago, um, they were able to learn to read. Um, that's Ireland is these colors lenses that you see. I also have Ireland syndrome. Um, it can be genetic, but if I had it when I was younger, um, I was unaware. Uh, maybe I had some problems with night vision, uh, but I never had reading issues. My, ch my children who have Irwin syndrome, actually one of them was in the middle of high school, close to the ends of high school, and he could barely read. And um, another one in fifth grade, and he could not read. They knew technically what to do, but then they could read more than uh, one or two sentences. And it's, it's incredible because we didn't really hear about it. And finally, you know, sort of by the way, uh, I heard about Irwin syndrome and I, I remembered it from years back with Donna Williams, who was a, a very famous autistic woman and author and artist. She, she once wrote about Irwin syndrome. She, she, she couldn't actually see an entire face without having her colored lenses. In. And, and so it sort of dawned on me, I took my kids to get them assessed. And in the evaluation, my, my child, and he was 11th grade at that point, never could read more than a paragraph and a half, and then things would start moving around, suddenly read, read an entire page fluently the minute he got colored uh, lenses or co colored um, overlays on the page. And I just stood there. I was shocked because there's not that much awareness about it, especially in Israel about your own um, And when I had my surgery, my vision went totally ballistic. I mean, I would look at people and their faces would melt or I'd see things double. Uh, stair, stairwells would give me um, vertigo. I actually could not look at a staircase. If I would go to a stairwell, the whole thing would start spinning around and I had no depth of perception. I couldn't uh, judge how far something was away from me or I'd stand and, and a road and the, the sidewalk would go up. It was, it was insane stuff, right? And the minute I got my glasses, which was four years after my surgery, I, uh, it stabilized my vision, which is incredible. Wow. Uh, yeah, it was like a miracle. Overnight, I could suddenly walk out the door and, and sort of feel normal or ha hold a conversation with somebody without, without having to mask. And masking is something that's often talked about with people with, uh, with sensory, uh, sensory problems or autism. And they have to work so hard to sort of fit in or, you know, act to quote, uh, normal. And, you know, but I would stand and have a conversation with somebody, with my neighbor outside. And as in the middle of the conversation, um, their face would split and you start melting and all kinds of insane stuff like that. I fortunately had the cognition to have a conversation in my brain that would say to me, your eyes are playing tricks on you. Don't pay attention to it and try and carry on this conversation. But, but it was very hard to do that, you know, because things look really weird. But I, at the same time, I imagined if I had been a child and that had happened to me, there was no way I would ever, ever, ever have looked at somebody because it would have been terrifying because you never knew what their face was going to do. And that's a really important insight that I had um, by, by going through this experience is that, that a lot of times people try and force people to uh, look people in the eye or in the face, you know, to train them into doing that. And, and that's, um, that can be really scary and detrimental, traumatic even. Um, and That's an interesting point. I never would have thought of that. No, we don't mm -hmm. think of cause and effect many times sure. Sure, and we sure. just think of something that's not quote socially acceptable uh, tell us about your new book moving forward reflections on autism neurodiversity brain surgery and faith okay um well the book is really a, a journey um it's a culmination of all the things i've learned and experienced uh, over the years um where the first part of the book um, and the reason I wrote it basically was to help people, which is really uh, very important. Uh, I felt like I, I'd gone through this, uh, this experience and I felt that it, it was unique and gave me insights that would be useful to people. So I said, okay, I'm going to organize myself and my thoughts and put it all down because I think that people can benefit from my journey being that I've been on both sides of the coin. And in addition to um, understanding, gaining understanding about neurodiversity, I also it's coping with tremendous challenge um, and, and fear and, and the process of recovery, which was and still is um, not easy um, and what helped along the way, because I think many, many people um, 
go through uh, incredible challenges in life and, and, and are looking for ways to uh, feel, uh, gain strength or understanding. Um, and I think naturally during that process, I also started, you know, I spent months sitting on the couch wondering how I was going to take the four steps to get to the to the bathroom or something. Um, and that was a major, major, major challenge because I didn't know how I was going to do that without hitting the floor because I, I couldn't walk, you know, and my balance was off and my everything was off. Um, and so you're stuck on the couch and not, you know, I was like, I was like one of those moms that was um, like, you know, trying to take on the super woman, woman role, you know, lots of kids and, and working and, and driving to, to treatments. And I was busy from early morning till late at night, every single day. Uh, and then I'm stuck on a couch and I can't even, you know, get myself a cup of tea kind of thing for months. And in that situation, sort of started thinking about what's the meaning of life and why am I here and what am I going to do with myself? Um, and why did this happen? And, and that's part of the journey. So so the book basically was um, the end result of the, that whole period. And, and, and the first part of the book basically talks about all the different kinds of, um, you know, diagnosis and coping with diagnosis, uh, sensory processing, and then uh, background information. Um, it's, I tried to write it in a sense that, in a way that made it easy for anyone to understand, but at the same time, the professional could benefit from uh, from my viewpoint. And then I go through a diagnosis um, and, and surgery and then a journal of, of uh, recovery. And during that, it was went through my physical challenge, but also as I was going through the challenges, trying to relate it back to the things in the beginning of the book where, oh, I'm experiencing this thing that I talked about and this is what I think about it. Or, oh, I observed this in my son and, or, or my other children. And, and let's see uh, how that makes sense. And I try to tie the whole thing together. And then um, faith was a part of that. Like I said, the meaning of life and how faith uh, inspired me and, and gave me, um, you know, I, I am Jewish. And as part of being Jewish is, is a mitzvah or doing good deeds. Is there's good deeds between uh, people and there's good deeds between a person and, and, and God. And, you know, one of the parts of Jewish philosophy is, um, or belief is that as long as you can do one more mitzvah, you have something to do here on this earth. And, and I think sometimes people, um, you know, they want to give up um, or let's say they, they retire and they don't know what to do, or they have, they're suddenly, uh, you know, somewhat immobilized or whatever the situation is. And it's kind of like, okay, I have to do a restart. And what's the purpose of my life? And, and why should I bother getting out of the bed now? Because it's really difficult. I can just wait a minute. No. There is something I need to do every day. I can I can bring good into the world. I can do something that you know, some sort of mitzvah, whether it's to help somebody else or or, or something that I can do that that uh, commanded to do. And 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 and, and, and the faith that um, there's a reason behind everything, even though I I, I you know I have a very small brain, I can't possibly understand why God did what He did. Uh, or why, why anything happens in this world, but I, I try and understand, and I think of the very quiet and, and um, listen to our inner voice, that's the inner uh, divine wisdom that we, that God naturally gives us, and, and we can sort of figure out um, what our mission is, and, and that's, that's one of my prayers every day, is to sort of figure out what my mission is, and to try and do it. The book was definitely part of that, um, and what we're doing now is part of that, and, because, um, and trying to get very well said. Very well said. Um, One of our interns uh, went on the birthright Israel uh, and never came back. He loves it over there. Uh, Alex uh, has been over there for oh, a couple of years now, has a great job, loves it there, loves it over in Israel. One of my best mentors ever, Dr. David Siegel, who used to be the head of Hadassah Hospital in Jerusalem. Mm. He uh, was up in Boston when I was training there, you know, 100 years ago. Boston mm -hmm. Hospital, and uh, it was, you know, it's it's interesting watching as an American Jew, watching uh, Israel progress and change, and sure. you know, go through all the all the different sure. great uh, land of opportunity. Though, um, it's changing could, a lot. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, I, 
I came to Israel the first time when I was uh, after college. I, I studied, I grew up in, in, in Long Island and I went to study in Massachusetts. And um, I just was curious, you know, I didn't, I didn't grow up in a religious household either, um, not at all. Uh, I mean, we were proud Jews, but I had no clue what that meant uh, because I didn't have the, the background. Uh, and I just sort of came to kibbutz to see what it was like. You know, I was curious. And one night, um, these two soldiers from the kibbutz said, have you seen Jerusalem yet? I said, no. I said, let's go. And they chuck me in the car and we drive up to Jerusalem. It was beautiful. It was so beautiful. They took me right at the walls, uh, near the walls of the old city. And at the time, um, that particular area, which now I can't really necessarily go there uh, comfortably, um, but it was, it was peaceful there at the time. I'm talking over 30 years ago. Um, and it was golden and beautiful. I step out of the car and suddenly I hear myself saying, oh, I'm home. And my ear says, what? What did your mouth just say? And I said, I don't know. I'm home. There was no reason on earth that should have happened, but I couldn't get that out of my, my mind or my heart. And, you know, after like, I went back to the kibbutz, tried to ignore that particular feeling, went back to New York after a couple of months and got a great job, an advertising firm, and everything is supposed to, nope, couldn't get it out of my mind. And then just one day, about seven months later, I just bought a one way ticket and said, Well, I'll be back when I finish what I need to do in Israel. And that didn't happen. <laughs> Is there anything we have not covered that you'd like to cover? I wish everyone would realize that we're all we're all different, and and that's what makes the world um, a wonderful place. And and that if everyone would be given an opportunity, and and if people would realize that you know, stop being so judgmental, and, and that, that you know, if a person has difficulty communicating, that doesn't mean that they don't they don't have something to give. And to stop trying to categorize people. You know, most people get diagnosed, and parents also for professionals. So there's one message I would like to give to professionals: like, stop taking away hope from from parents. You know, a lot of professionals that sort of give you sort of bleak outcome. You know, where my, you know, your son will never talk, or or you, you can't do this or that. Nobody knows. Nobody knows anything. And I think nobody about neurodiversity really understands anything. And like, and they're always in a rush. The person has to progress, you know, from the time kids are in school, they start timing how quickly they read or how quickly they, they take a test or whatever it is. And, or they're in a rush, so the child's not making progress quickly enough. And, and, and so they, you know, it's like, slow down and see that everyone's different and, and the journey is what makes the difference. The journey, it doesn't matter how quickly anyone's progressing. They just need to keep move, like, my book, moving forward. It's making sure that the person is, is happy. Trying to, you know, parents or, or professionals just need to become scientists, uh, uh, sociologists, to look at the person and try and figure out what's making that person do that thing. What's difficult? How can I help? How can I understand? And spend every day observing that person and seeing what's changed. And, and, and understanding that there are no quick fixes, retraining cognition, overcoming sensory uh, uh, challenges are things that take a long time. You cannot do them behaviorally in a year. They take years. But once the foundations are laid, if, you re, re, if, you're, if you're organizing someone's cognitive abilities, and it takes years to do that, but once that, that foundation uh, is, is set, then there is no limit to where the person can go. Very well said. No two brains are alike. They're like snowflakes. No. Yep. no. And that's, I mean, that's why we're all unique divine individuals. We're not supposed to be. We're not supposed to be. Jackie, it's been great to talk to you today. Same here. You're inspirational. The book's terrific. And let's hold up that book one more time. Sure. And stuff that's not in my book, you can find on my blog. I've started a blog on my website. Um, website? www.jackiesbooks.com. It's J-A-C-K-I-S-B-O-O-K-S.com. There's no E at the end of my name. My parents wanted me to be unique. So nobody spells my name right because I don't have an E or a Y at the end of it. It's just Jackie with an I. 
So it's jackiesbooks.com. And I do have a blog that I've recently launched there. And there's, there's articles, um, uh, different kinds of thoughts um, uh, that, you know, the book couldn't cover everything. And I talk more about education and uh, thoughts about ADHD. And there's, there's all kinds of articles on there. Um, we look forward to having you back also. This ah, is, with pleasure. And, uh, with pleasure. Your article you wrote for Different Brains was great, and we welcome more articles by you. Anytime. So, yeah, actually, when I saw your site, before I, 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 uh, I wrote you the first time, um, I looked at the, the philosophy of your site. I said, this is exactly the, the place that I would like to be. Um, we have the same philosophy and the same objectives. And and uh, you know, the more the more we team up, and then uh, with other people in the field, we can start changing the world. Hey, we need to make a revolution. There's there's no question that things need to change. And um, you know, if we have the tools and the uh, to make it happen, then well, Jackie, it's been a pleasure to have you here at Different Brains. Thank you so much, and we look forward to more of your articles, more interviews, and keep up the good work you're doing over there in Israel and around the world. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I'm looking forward to collaborating and hopefully we'll join forces and help change the world. Exploring Different Brains is a production of Different Brains. Visit us at differentbrains.org.